Thank you very much. And uh, uh, <coughs> so, uh, yes, I was presented. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Labsan, but actually, I was uh, very interested in the last uh, uh, presentation uh, because if, even if I don't speak Polish, I could understand the last the last part. And I wanted to actually to start uh, from where you left it uh, about the will robots take my jobs and all these things. Uh, even if for teachers it's not a problem, for many other occupations it's, it's going to be an issue. And uh, there's many people talking about uh, how, uh, like uh, I can see, um, like Mackenzie is talking about uh, how 30% of the activities uh, <coughs> of the major occupations in the U.S. could be automated. How the World Economic Forum reports is talking about uh, how 50% of the companies expect that automation will lead to reaction in uh, to reaction in their full uh, full-time workforce by 2022. Um, and there are many other people talking about the, about the same topic on how this is going to to happen. And uh, they all point out that uh, one of the things that is going to be more key for this phenomenon is the, the, all the lifelong learning, uh, how people will have to retrain themselves uh, more often than, than before. <clears throat> um, so retraining means that universities, colleges, um, other uh, educational providers will have to be providing the contents not only in the beginning, but during the whole uh, life of the of the of the work period of time. So, checking, however, what happens very often is that uh, in many universities, and this is just one example, they so in many universities, um, it happens that they provide some virtual uh, online education and so on, but typically only in certain fields. Like uh, if you check many universities, they provide mainly like in business, in languages, in uh, uh, marketing, in those things, like, uh, but it's usually not, the, not so much in engineering. If we go to, the, to online courses like in Udemy, Coursera and so on, it's always the case that, for example, for software development, you have like 10,000 courses and probably more. Uh, however, for finding engineering, you have to go to teaching academics, and there you will have some something of engineering. If you check uh, in engineering, it's only 470, uh, 480 courses, and uh, and that includes already software development. In Coursera, for example, you, you check uh, business and computer science, and then whenever you go to physics, the number of courses drops. It's like so so less. If you go to and this is not something related to the future of work that uh, that uh, we were talking before. Like uh, all these jobs are jobs that are have like a future, even according to those uh, reports. Like uh, we're talking about uh, like uh, I don't know like uh, electronic technology engineers, uh, chemical processing operators, and so on. So, however, whenever you go to any of these platforms, you see that uh, I don't know like uh, philosophy has more courses than chemistry, music and art more co more courses than mechanical engineering, history more than electrical engineering which may be fine, but it's, it's, it's actually surprising. Um, and yeah, Lambda School is yet, a, yet another, and those like, don't even have anything uh, on this. So I, was, I, I wanted to, because um, uh, like even though this talk is just after lunch, I wanted also to, to try to ask you uh, things so, so it's more interactive. Uh, so what do you think it happens this, that there are always many more courses on, like, there are always uh, less courses on uh, engineering and uh, physics and this kind of courses compared to um, like uh, other type of uh, like almost everything everything else in the in their fields. Does this happen to your universities as well? Do you provide online courses and mainly in, in like software marketing, business languages? Never in Jose, never in, in industrial uh, uh, engineering, electronics engineering, and so on. Okay. <laughs> so it happens. And why do you think it happens? Because engineering and other practical courses require physical objects to interact with and physical skills that can easily be learned online. Okay. Yeah. So you actually need physical things. We learn software and so on. You can code in your computer. Um, languages, you can do the exercise in your computer, but uh, everything else is always like typically more difficult in, in case of physics and, and so on. Any other reason? Anyone else? Okay, so in like how can we improve it? Um, the, 
as a, as you mentioned, one of the key challenges is the, the experimentation, like uh, being able to, to experiment with physical objects, as you said, uh, uh, in the, um, through, the, through, through, the, through the internet. So laboratories require a physical location, and whenever you go to, to online courses, the number of courses and enrollment drastically, drastically is lower. Um, but this is also a problem. Experimentation has also other challenges, even in in presential classroom, in typical, in normal traditional education. For example, um, it happens a lot with, uh, like, even with high schools, uh, but also in universities. You never have as much equipment as you want to, uh, as you could have, or as you would like to have, uh, because of this problem. Because you have to buy the equipment, have the time for the equipment, have the time for preparing the lessons uh, with the equipment, maintain the equipment, and, and all these things. Um, so. Both in tracing and online education, educators need affordable and real experimentation. What, uh, what in labs and what we are working on is in, in providing remote laboratories, which are real laboratories available online where the student can l use real equipment from their computer. So I'm going to first introduce it with a couple of examples. Um, In the first case, I'm going to use one of the robots. If I go to here, here, in this case, I can write my own code. This is mainly for schools. We have a version which is like with real uh, code. And then I can compile it online, which is more normal. And then I can submit this, the code that I just made to one of the existing robots, uh, wherever they are. So right now it will be directed to somewhere, and this is a real robot. In this case, it's in the University of Deusto, so it's in Spain. And I can move this robot and uh, move it wherever I want. And then I can send the code that I just wrote. So I was writing some code. I can see the code running inside the robot. So after a couple of seconds, it will, it will be the, my code is running here. So whenever I'm pressing the buttons, I, the robot will move, will say hello, ET 2019, and, and, and so on. If I go back, I could change the code and then send it, to, send it back to the, to the laboratory. In the same way, um, let me see. Uh, so in that case, like uh, what we have is this kind of robot there, which is what we saw. So we do a set of cameras. You can actually see the, see, see the, the particular robot. Um, in other cases, we have electronics laboratories. Uh, I'm not going to show this one. But we also have um, FPGA laboratories. How many of you teach with FPGAs or use FPGAs at all? Like uh, in electronics engineering? Is anyone? No? OK. Oh, like a uh, Janus. So in this case, the, uh, it's similar. Like um, if I go to the particular laboratories, and they go all the way to to, for example, the Intel laboratories. I could write code in VHDL or Verilog, and then I will be able to do some code, synthesize it, and uh, submit it to, to a real FPA, uh, real FPA somewhere else. So in this case, I will go to, to Navarra in Spain, to other university, and I will be able to send my, my code, and then start click on the buttons, and then in the real world, there is one of these boards, which is actually executing my code and, and running my, my code. So here I can play with this and, and, and so on. Now, if I go back. So in this case, we have laboratories in the University of Federal of, Santa Ca of uh, Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil, and also in UPNA in Navarra. <clears throat> um, however, all this field of remote laboratories is a pretty old uh, field. It's uh, the first lab remote laboratory that we know is in 1993 in Ohio State University. Uh, there are many un uh, universities that have developed uh, remote laboratories, like, uh, like from MIT, the Hardison, and the Sacrison is in Sweden, Murray is in Australia, and so on. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have already used remote laboratories before in class or just by test or something. Anyone has used other Janus? 
So, so how many of you are have used? Do you use it in class or? Okay. Okay. And uh, do you still use it or? Not this year. Okay. Uh, so typically using it every year. Anyone? All right. Um, and why is this? Why, what, what were the problems in your case, for example, for not using it more years? It's difficult to say because uh, sometimes the group of students they are willing to do experiments, even the, our own lab is very occupied and it's not so easy to arrange it. Um, at the first year, there's a problem of uh, language because we like to communicate in English and not to translate the students' work into the laboratory people. <coughs> Okay, um, so but I didn't understand, like, they sent the, the things in English and then somebody had to translate it to... The question is that students should send the request uh, of the question in English, but the, the first year, the, the, like, language skills are not very developed, so it's a problem. And uh, was there any other problem? Yeah, that's uh, what we're uh, Are there any other problems with this? Okay. So, there are several problems, including like uh, uh, robustness of the laboratories. Some days laboratories are broken because typically, so far in the literature, always is like one university has one laboratory, they provide it kind of like as a friend, like to other universities, and they use it. But sometimes equipment is broken and things like that. Sometimes it's not scalable in the sense that you need many boards or many, like many. Uh, because if you want to use it in class with many students, it's a problem. Uh, sometimes the development is complex. Like typically, you need many different people. Like you need software people, you need hardware people, you need pedagogic people, and many research teams don't have all the all the all of them. You also need certain critical mass of laboratories because sometimes if you want if you want to convince the management for using this kind of solution and you only have one laboratory, it's more difficult than when you can actually provide something uh, something better. Uh, the interactions in the university context, uh, like all the uh, GDPR, all these kind of uh, issues with the privacy and, and, all, uh, and so on, and also the sustainability, like making sure that what happens if in Austria they don't maintain equipment in one year or something like that. So in Lausanne we were trying to focus on each of these topics. So the first one would be robustness and trust. In our case, we like every remote laboratory we provide is always like uh, located in more than one university at the same time, so we can guarantee that if one is broken, at least we have another one uh, that replaces it. So for example, in the case of the electronics laboratory, we have it in the University of Georgia, in the uh, TU Dortmund in Germany, uh, in Costa Rica, in um, uh, yeah, uh, Costa Rica, also in Spain, in uh, the University of Deusto. Uh, the robot that I was showing, we have, uh, an we are building another copy in Colombia, and South Africa, we will deploy it uh, next month. Basically, what we try to do is to have multiple copies so as to avoid that uh, if one is done, which is something normal, uh, we have uh, issues with that. Also, we have like a lot of um, computer vision and so on to make sure that uh, like every couple of hours we're checking all the robots to see if one is broken and this kind of thing. Uh, regarding scalability, I'm going to show one quick demo of other two laboratories. Um, for example, if I go to the inclined plane, uh, to the cinem or yeah, to kinematics. In this case, the student can select an angle like uh, 32 or whatever, and they can start the experiment. And they can see a red ball and a, and a tube, and the tube is moving to reach the 31 degrees. Whenever it reaches the, those degrees, the ball drops, and there are a set of sensors which are measuring in what millisecond the ball drops. So at some point, it's going to drop the ball. Um, and when this is done, uh, each of these blue things have a, are sensors that have, a, have measured in what millisecond was 56 centimeters. Like it, it took uh, 527 uh, milliseconds to, to go. 
in this case, um, going back to scalability, the issue is uh, how to have like many of these if you want to use it in class with uh, other students. However, in many cases, in many laboratories, um, like, uh, like in this one, the student can only select one value from, zero to, from 1 to 90. So what we did in this case was we recorded like 90 times, like all each of the angles. We re recorded it several times, so we have 900 recordings right here. And this, whenever the student selects, what we saw is not real time. It's not, it, it's not happening in Brazil anymore. What happened is that we selected an angle, and then we are loading the particular video and data of randomly one of those 10 recordings to get that value and, 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 and show it to the student. This way, the, I mean, like all data and multimedia are real and pre-recorded. In this sense, uh, we also have laboratories of uh, reactivity that uh, in Australia, which mo has more than 6,000 uh, recordings, like it took like more than three weeks to record all the potential combinations of the student. Uh, in the case of uh, University of St. Thomas in Houston, we have uh, laboratories of uh, biology where you put a worm in some water with caffeine and you compare how fast it moves compared to putting it in regular water and, and, and so on. Um, in regarding the, the development process, we have provided many, like as University of Deusto and uh, Lapsan, we have provided many uh, open source technologies for development of, uh, of remote laboratories because we are interested in universities being able to create their own remote laboratories in a scalable way. Um, and we also have the service of developing remote laboratories with universities. We typically work with universities for creating those laboratories. It's not only that uh, we don't have like all the laboratories in our offices or something. We, we partner universities and provide them access to, to developing these laboratories. And what we are working on is creating this large network of uh, remote laboratories, including like this, that's a flow loop in, um, in Germany, in Klaustal, where for um, for petroleum, for drilling uh, engineering. Um, like in India, we have laboratories of, uh, of electronics, FPAs with uh, ceilings, uh, pendulum. Uh, <coughs> and, and right now we have, we're working with 21 universities in all, in 11 countries, in all the continents. We have like from Australia to India to uh, Germany, South Africa, um, like uh, everywhere. Um, and we then we create all these uh, laboratories or we install laboratories there and, and so on. Uh, regarding integrations, like we also are supporting like all the major learning management systems like uh, Moodle, Sakai, Canvas, Ilias, Blackboard, and um, Google Classroom, for especially for schools. And uh, the students don't. Uh, so this way, the teachers don't have to actually uh, have all the um, how's it, uh, like the students don't have to register in Labsan.com or anything like that. They just go to the to the, to the learning management system and automatically access the particular laboratory that the teacher wants. And the, the instructor can know exactly who accessed what laboratory in what moment and so on. So there is this uh, unified platform for, for that. And regarding sustainability, we are actually, like a Labson is a spin-off of a university, what we, we, are, we are charging to consumers to access the laboratories and then we are compensating the providers. So for the providers have uh, some incentive to, to maintain these laboratories and, 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 and so on. Um, we are focused in universities and schools, um, like uh, all in between uh, traditional universities, uh, but also distance universities like UNED in, in Costa Rica, also high schools. Um, and yeah, like, uh, well, uh, Labs and uh, as I said, we are a spin-off of a university in, in Spain, in, um, in Bilbao. Uh, the co-founders are actually my colleague Luis and myself. Uh, the, office, the main office is in Bilbao, in the, in the near the university, uh, while I'm located in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And, um, and yeah, um, if you want to check all what I was presented today, it's available in labsand.com. And uh, uh, if you go to, to the fans and so on, you can actually use it for free and, and so on. And if you send us an email, like, you can use it uh, like, uh, for several months for research or testing or whatever. Uh, so yeah, um, with this, I finished uh, my presentation.